you would turn in your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Mark, where we're heading this morning. Mark chapter 10, to be a little more specific. Mark chapter 10, we're going to be looking at uh, the story of uh, the rich young man. And uh, it's always one of those challenging stories. Most of us are familiar with the story. Um, but um, we're going to look at it a little more in depth when we go into this idea of stewardship here this morning and uh, what that looks like. So Mark chapter 10, uh, beginning at verse 17, if you guys have gotten there. And it reads this. And as he was setting out on his journey, this is Jesus, as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Well, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Well, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we've left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly, I say to you, there's no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. For many who are first will be last and the last first. Let's pray. Uh, Gracious Father, we just again thank you for the opportunity to gather here together. Uh, Lord God, uh, coming from again, as we mentioned, different weeks, some trying weeks, some trials, some tribulations, as it were, uh, in our work weeks. Some of us had great weeks. Uh, Some of us are coming, obviously, with great peace and joy, but we all come before you. Lord, seeking you, seeking your, your word, seeking your wisdom, seeking your presence, even collectively as we join here together. And so, Lord God, I thank you for the time of worship that we just had, a times of singing of praise and, and of how you uh, have given us life, an eternal life through your Son, of how you provide for us, how you care for us, how you protect us. And so, Lord God, I pray as we now get into your word, I pray, Lord God, that you would speak to us by your Holy Spirit, the very Spirit that resides in us as believers. Lord God, that you would speak into the ears of those who are still sort of on that edge, who are still trying to figure you out and and what this means. Lord, speak into their ears this day of their value and worth in your sight. Lead us into this word, Lord God. We know that it is really beyond really our comprehension. And yet in some way, break it down for us here, Holy Spirit, so that we would learn and that we would put into practice these teachings. Lord God, again, in sincerity and humbleness, use the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, and that it be pleasing and honoring to you, and that you would use them in some small measure, Lord God, to to, to teach here today, to bring glory to you, and that you would use us in this week to come. We just thank you, Jesus. And we pray this all in your precious name. Amen. I don't know if you, uh, some of you read, uh, read an article recently. There was a, a study in the U.S., actually one of the universities, Georgetown University, 
um, and they did a study on uh, the socioeconomic contributions of religion to American society. And so basically what they did, they took all the different statistics, they took all the different sums and totals and that sort of thing, and they tried to come up with a, with a number um, of what is the, the, the economic implications of religion in the U.S., particularly speaking of, of the Christian faith. Anybody want to take a guess? What is the impact economically in the U.S. for religion and Christian faith? Throw it out there. Ten bucks. <laughs> That's Canadian. Yeah, we got to do the transfer. Yeah, the currency. Anybody? Nobody wants to even take a guess? No? $1.2 trillion every year. That's the annual economic uh, influence, as it were, for religion in the U.S., uh, it's, some of the, uh, the things were this. There's obviously contributions, 1.2 each to the economy and society. Uh, one of the amazing things of this study was that despite, it says, declining religious affiliation uh, in America, obviously people are, are, are no longer attached to churches as they once were, right? It's declining in a lot of ways. I uh, said so even though it's declining, um, the, the, the religious giving amount has actually tripled in the last 15 years. So over the last 15 years, people have been sort of exiting churches, Right, for different reasons, skepticisms and all kinds of different stuff. But it actually has been tripling all the time. Um, the money that is spent on social programs uh, through the religious, uh, religious organizations, $9 billion. Uh, it, some of these programs that is spent, there's 130,000 alcohol and drug abuse recovery programs supported by churches. 130,000. This is just in the U.S., uh, 94,000 programs to support veterans and their families. 26,000 programs to prevent HIV and AIDS and to support those living with the disease. Uh, 121,000 programs to provide support or skills training for the unemployed adults. So this is, this is all these things, right, that, 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 uh, that Christianity, really the church, is doing. And one of the amazing things is that with this 1.2 million Excuse me, 1.2 trillion. Try to get the two and the trillion getting going. This 1.2 trillion impact is more than the annual revenues of Apple, Amazon, and Google combined. Yes, church, way to go. Crush those. No, no I'm just kidding. Um, another one was quite interesting that they said, because uh, often usually when we talk about churches, right, it's always, oh, well, you know, you're tax exempt. You don't pay you know, taxes on the, on the buildings and the properties, and that's always a big thing. It's becoming a big thing. Uh, it has been a big thing even in the city. Uh, you know, they're trying to get some church properties taxable, right, because they're trying to get that revenue. Uh, so I found this quite interesting, um, that while there's this $1.2 trillion, the religious tax exemptions cost the U.S. $71 billion. So it's a pretty big amount, right? Uh, but really, 17 times more has the church put into the economy than has tried to get sort of, you know, tax freebies out of it. 17 times more into the... You imagine if, right, we just shut all the churches down. What would happen? All the church or the religious organizations. I'm sure there's lots of other, obviously, social programs. So we begin to see the impact, really, of the church on an economic level. Um, it said, uh, for instance, right, there's always these attacks upon the church. It says, for instance, 63% of atheists and agnostics believe that religious institutions contribute nothing to so solving social programs. And so, or excuse me, solving social problems. That's always that big thing. What's the relevancy of the church today? And we begin to see this, this incredible uh, support of, of social programs uh, health, obviously HIV and AIDS programs. We get to see, obviously, veterans in the U.S. is a huge support down there. Skills training, unemployment. That is just those things. That has nothing to do with even uh, food, right? Food or, or sustenance. That's not in any of those hundred and some thousands of things that are going on. And, uh, and it kind of goes on. It says, our society clearly values deeds over doctrines. People believe that our faith is real when they see it as relevant, Right? Too often we get that, you know, that picture of the, you know, the, the, the televangelist who just wants to buy a new jet. Right? Send me your money. And they say, well, how relevant is that? And our society wants that. They're saying, what is the impact? What is the relevancy of the church today? And obviously this is speaking about economic ways. He, he finishes this article by saying, when skeptics claim that religion is irrelevant or even dangerous, we can cite this study in particular. 
He says, but we must not stop there. He says, we demonstrate the personal value of our faith when it moves us to a personal ministry. Basically, just think, don't rely on the statistics, right? If somebody comes up and, you know, says, you know, church is irrelevant, why should I do it? Well, I see that Georgetown University, no. You begin a relationship. You begin to make a difference. We can't argue people into a salvation, but we can begin to, to show of how, the, the, how our Christian faith impacts our lives personally, but even more so within our society because we are to bring light into the dark places. We are to be the agents of change and transformation, spreading the gospel message. Now, this morning, when we kind of pair this, uh, this story together with our passage this morning, um, I get the great privilege of speaking about finances here today. Is everybody ready? Well, yeah, four of you. Good. Because often when we talk about religion, when we talk about the church, two things usually come up, right? It's usually rules, right? Oh, there's got so many rules. And the next one is, is money, finances. All they want is your money. So I'm not going to go to church because all they want is your money. And they don't always see where that money ends up, right? Into social programs and all kinds of different things. And so usually people say, you know what, it's all about rules, it's all about money. And oftentimes, sadly, that also becomes the, the mindset, I believe, of people within the church. And so they pull back. They may be part of the pews. They may be part of statistics when it comes to membership or attendance and that sort of thing. But really when it comes to the overall purpose, a lot of times it's the rules and it is the the money that kind of sets people apart even within the church, even within the pews. And I think this morning, this is really what this story is all about. When we talk about this character of this rich young man, Uh, Some of the other Gospels talk about this rich young ruler. Obviously he had some status. He had something uh, about him. And many will actually suspect that he was probably part of uh, the group of the Pharisees. He was part of the Pharisees because he goes into this very legalistic sort of uh, ideal. Right? He he goes into that right away. And and so we're kind of dealing again with these rules and money when we talk about this, uh, this, this story. Now we've been going through a series on on stewardship. Right? And right away, I ask you guys a question. When I say stewardship, what do you guys think of? You think of money. You think of finances. But hopefully, if we've been going through you know, our lives, our time, uh, you know, all the different things, our gifts, all these things, this is all to be stewarded, to take care of it, to, to nurture it, to see it used and grown. These are all things that God has given and provided for us. And now we're going to get into that, that finances, which is often this, this sort of really touchy subject, isn't it? Because we, we all have this, this, these strings attached to us when it comes to finances times. Whether there's lots of money in the account or whether there's very little or the negative some months. Money is always a touchy subject. In fact, you've probably heard that, that almost more than any other thing, Jesus talked about money. He was always talking about money. Right? Right? He was, there, was, there was a reason for it because he knew the struggles that it was going to have. This idea of provision, this idea of sustenance, this idea that, that money often takes over us. And he was always talking about money, which is quite interesting because often we don't want to talk about money because it's a very touchy subject. But this idea of stewardship is how can we steward our finances? How do we steward our money? How do we take care of the things that God has given us? And I kind of come up with the 4G. I got a 4G network going on here this morning. Have you ever heard of the 4G network from SaskTel, right? Yes, well, probably not SaskTel, but obviously it's well known. So I kind of thought, you know what, we need a, sort of a, a network, a framework. 4G network is just simply a way to receive data and calls and all that sort of stuff. But really, when we think about money, what's sort of the filters, right? How do we kind of process this idea of money, of finances, wealth, as it were? And so I'm just going to use 4Gs here this morning. And the first one we're going to really talk about, we're going to really kind of uh, put it in perspective because I believe it is the undergirding of everything else we're going to talk about here this morning. And so the first G, when we're talking about stewardship of finances, is simply God. God. Because as we talked about all the other things that we, we, we get to steward, right, in our time and our lives and our gifts, what was, what was the origin of each and every one of them? It was God. God gives us our lives. God gives us our time. He gives us our, 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 our gifts. He gives us all these things that we are to steward. And I believe the same is true for money. God provides for us. We looked at this a little bit when we talked about the, the stewarding of, of work, 
our, our jobs, our vocations, our callings, or whatever you might want to sort of label that or attach it to. God has given us the ability, Scripture says, to produce wealth. He's given us brains and backs, right, to put forward things. And when we work, when we realize that we've been created to produce, right, to create and cultivate, we can kind of go back to the garden, and that was sort of the tasks that he had for, for Adam and for Eve. When we, when we begin to realize that we were made to produce, and we get over some of the ideas of even laziness that we get into our own particular North American culture, right? Because we get it pretty easy here. When we get over that and we believe that we can begin to produce, usually wealth is a result of production. We, we can go through the stories I've been reading through uh, of Genesis. That's part of my readings uh, over the last probably month or so, and I've, I've been gotten through, you know, the patriarchs, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and, and it's, it's amazing that every one of them, it says, you know, God blessed their, their work, made them fruitful, right? Abraham was a very rich man, Isaac, and, and, and uh, even Jacob, right? Jacob kind of left with nothing to go and find a bride. Then he gets the bride, and all of a sudden he leaves uh, his father-in-law's house, and he's got tons of stuff because God blessed him. He provided for him. His God's hand was with him, okay? But the problem is, is that too often when we look at those stories, we often think that it's just the abundance of goods, which means God's blessings. Have you ever thought sometimes that God blesses us with poverty? Because too often, I think, and we're going to get into this with the story of the rich young ruler, plus sort of the afterthoughts in verses 23 and following of the disciples, because their thinking was always that God's blessing was for the rich. They were rich because God had blessed you. But what if you were rich because God cursed you? We have to get over this idea, and this is where we start off with this first G of God. When we think about finances, we've always got to put God in the forefront. It's God's got to be, the, again, that, that main filter, that main priority when we speak about finances of wealth or stewardship of anything, really. We've got to put God up at the forefront. And right away, this is really where the story of the rich young man comes in. The conversation begins. Quite interesting enough, right? It says this, this man, this rich young man, runs up and kneels before Jesus. Picture this, right? This is a rich young dude. Okay, He's got lots of money. He's, he's obviously got some sort of upbringing. If we can say he is a Pharisee, okay, these are very prominent people, people of status. Okay? But we get this, this, this running up and just this falling down before Jesus. And he says, what must I do to receive eternal life? Right away, we begin to see a bit of a, a, a paradigm here, don't we? He says, what must I do? We get that legalistic thinking, don't we? What can I do? How do I achieve this? How do I grab on to this? This is a very pharisaical teaching. But it's also a teaching we get to sort of put into us sometimes too. What do I do? But again, the beauty of the Christian faith is that we don't get to do anything. We get to receive it. We get to receive it. And But he, he runs up, he kneels before Jesus, he says, good teacher, what must I do? Right away, Jesus wants to change. He wants to, he wants to redirect this rich young guy. And he says, why do you call me good? Why do you call me good? Because only God is good. Now, this isn't just, you know, like a good host. This isn't like a good, you know, good nutty buddy bar. When he talks about this idea of good, this is holy. This is righteous. And so Jesus is trying to redirect him to this idea of, why do you call me good when only God is good? He's trying to feel this guy out a little bit. Because this guy is asking him a question. He's pleading for a, a, a question to be answered. He runs up and kneels before him, tell me the answer. Jesus is saying, are you really going to listen to the answer I'm going to give you? Isn't that often the way with our finances sometimes? Oh, Lord, you can, you can have my money. And, and you got five cents in the bank. You can have it and use it and multiply it all you want. Maybe he wants, well, you know, give me the five cents. Wait a minute, what? No. Jesus is saying, are you really going to listen to me? You call me a good teacher, but only God is good. Are you really going to listen to my teachings? Again, he's framing this with God at the forefront. At God at the forefront. He's trying to help this young man see his flawed questioning, see his flawed interest, see his flawed heart. 
And we're going to begin to see sort of the character of this, of this young man. And yet, at the same time, he's still just, he's veered off that, that millimeter at the start and now has gone off to the side. He started off well. And yet he won't end well, at least from what we see here by the end of the story in Mark chapter 10. This young man right from the beginning is saying, what do I do? What can I do? How do I gain this? And again, it's like I said, it's a bit of a paradigm because it's what can I do to receive my inheritance? My inheritance. How do we get our inheritance, folks? Somebody dies, right? You have to be often, when we think about an inheritance, we often think of uh, somebody who is related as well, right? Well, the people in the family get that. Right away, this, this rich young man, he's saying, really, how do I become a good enough son that I can get an inheritance? Of how I can get an inheritance? I think, in fact, maybe this rich young man has probably, in some way, figured out his good deeds equal financial rewards. He sort of put this all together. If I'm a good son to God, as it were, then I'm going to be blessed. Again, this is this thinking, this flawed thinking. If I am a good son, if I do the right things, then I'm going to be blessed financially. And if I do the right things, because he's trying to figure out the right things to do to get into heaven, what do I do to get into heaven? The problem is, is that not all the children get an inheritance. Oftentimes when we speak about inheritance, it's not just the good things you do, but there's about a relationship and love that comes out of it. Right? I was thinking of my, my own family in particular. Um, as I was growing up, uh, I only knew one set of my grandparents, um, and, uh, and, and they, they had a little bit of money, okay? They had owned a business, and there was a little bit of money in the bank. They were getting older, okay? I, I, didn't, I don't come from royalty or tycoons or anything like that, so like, he's got a million bucks in the bank. No, I got nothing, okay? Um, but my grandparents had some money, and, uh, and really, it, it became a struggle for a lot of my family members because they were trying to be good children and grandchildren. Why? In order to get the money. Right? They said, well, we want to be part of this, this will. We want to be part of these things. And I began to see the deception. I began to see the deceiving. Because they just, you know, they'd, they'd be all nice and great and wonderful. And then all of a sudden we'd leave. And then I'll be like, yo, I can't wait for those old codgers to die. They were part of the family. They were children and grandchildren of my grandparents. But there was no love there at all. It was simply because they wanted to get something. They were trying to be the good children. And Jesus is trying to tell this rich young guy, it's not just about being good. It has to be a loving relationship here. There's got to be more. And he begins to sort of show this rich young man that there's a division between his good works and his love for God. Jesus goes into it. Well, you know the commandments, right? He goes through these ten commandments of things. Jesus isn't saying, well, you've know, got to be legalistic. You've got to go through all these things, right? An adultery, don't commit adultery, no murder, no stealing, no false witness, uh, no, no defrauding, which is quite interesting. He uses that terminology, defrauding, because most of the time when we think of the Ten Commandments, we think of coveting. But there's this idea of defrauding that is going on there. That's a whole sermon in and of itself. But Jesus goes through these, sort of these indicators. If you have a loving relationship with your father, you, these are just going to come naturally. But he says, well, you know, you've done all these things. And the young man says, I've done all these things since my, my youth. But Jesus says, you've lacked a very crucial thing. A very crucial thing. Go sell everything. Give it to the poor. Come and follow me. Jesus says, it's not just about your good works. It's not just about this facade of religiosity. But it's this idea that you're missing out on love. Didn't Jesus say, what is the, the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second flows from that, to love your neighbor as you love yourself. We can do all kinds of good things. The Apostle Paul said very much, right? I can move mountains and I can do all these wonderful things, but if I don't have love, I got squat. This rich young man has had it all. He's very religious. He has status with his pharisaical background. He's got money, he's got wealth, he's got influence, he's got all these things, and yet he still feels that emptiness, doesn't he? 
Because he runs up to Jesus and throws himself at his feet and says, what must I do? I've run this little religious hamster wheel for so long. I've tasted the best of things. I'm rich. I got influence. I'm still young. I got lots of life ahead of me. I got my health. I got everything. But he's realizing he's still empty. He's still empty. He knows there's something missing. And I think this is why Jesus, it says that Jesus loved him. Because he was just almost there. He knew. I think there was the, the Spirit must have been working on this guy. Right? We can put it in sort of evangelical terms today. Because this young man had everything, and still he wasn't satisfied. There was still a question. And Jesus puts out that challenge, that linchpin for him. And it was he loved his wealth more than God. That was it. That was, that was the whole thing. That was that linchpin for him. He loved his wealth more than he loved God. He loved his gold more than he loved God. And that was this whole point of this whole story. And so Jesus is trying to get our minds wrapped around this, this concept of finances and wealth and money. What is its priority? What is its hold on our lives? And everything else about stewardship of finances and money is going to, to, to be framed in this very question. Is it gold or is it God? What is the priority in your life? Because too often times we're going to see that the disciples think, again, that God blesses us with riches. If you're rich, you're blessed by God. Too often we begin to make gold our God. And sometimes not even knowing it. I've often thought that we sometimes we put in our good deeds into this big God ATM and we expect money to come out. Right? Oh, I've done this for you, Lord. Right? Oh, I'm, I've done that. I've do, oh, I do all these things. Where's my reward? Right? We're like a parrot on somebody's shoulder. Right? Polly want a cracker? Right? And you're saying, yeah, if I insert this, if I insert this good deed into God's ATM machine, he's going to give me something back. And I thought, you know what? Isn't that a contrast to the whole story of Job? If you know the story of Job at all, okay, Job is one of the richest people in the known world. It says so. He has everything. He's got, he's got lands. He's got animals. He's got servants. He's got everything. But what's on top of his list? His relationship with God. That's how it all starts out. He had all this stuff, but he, he always, you know, just in case his children might have sinned, I'm just going to do a sacrifice just in case. Right? I'm going to make sure that my relationship with God is always first. I'm just going to, i got to put it out there. Right? And so he's, he's trying to work this all out, but it's his righteousness that gets him to lose all his riches, isn't it? When we begin to read that story between you know, the attacks of, of the enemy. And so we can't, we can't figure out that it's, you're rich, so you must be blessed by God. You may be rich and be cursed by God. It's the idea we've got to put God first. We've got to put God first. It's not about the rules. It's not about the blessings, the money, the wealth, or whatever that we think that God's going to kind of just exchange for us. But we've got to get in that right, loving relationship with God. That's the priority. I thought, you know, as I was reading through uh, Mark chapter 10 and kind of some of the surrounding things, chapters, uh, it's interesting that Mark chapter 10 actually begins off with divorce. With divorce. What are two of the main things that bring divorce? Usually it's communication, or a miscommunication, or a lack of communication, or a communicating of affections, or some kind of a rules of engagement, if you will, and finances. Right? It's rules of engagement. Are these rules, and it's money. This goes back to the rich young ruler, isn't it? I, I kind of thought, I don't know if you guys follow some, you know, the, the, the pop culture stuff, the media stuff. Have you guys heard about about, uh, about Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt. They're getting divorced. It is. Well, they've been together for 12 years, only married for two. But there's like six kids involved, right? And at first, I'm just like, who cares? Right? I'm saying, well, it's, you know, it's probably a $400 million divorce. He's got 
200, she's got 200, and all this sort of stuff. And at first I'm just like, who gives a rip? And then I'm like, wait a minute, there's six kids involved. Hey, right? you guys want to be jerks, you guys want to fight over finances or whatever that, but there's kids. Right? And the media is just tearing everybody apart, who does this and who does that. But it's interesting that Jesus, that they start off this passage about divorce. It's about rules. It's about, it's about money. It's about how we engage. How do we communicate with one another? We cannot, we cannot have money or wealth trump our love, trump our relationship with God. In fact, Jesus will teach in other places that we cannot serve both God and money. He says you will love one, and hate the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. He says you cannot serve them both. So we have to get, again, this idea that God and our love and our relationship with him has to be first and foremost, even when we're talking about this idea of money, particularly when we talk about money, because it is such a divisive thing. It's such a touchy subject. Because very easily, sometimes without even knowing, God money will become a god in our lives for some way it will lead us it will call us it will draw us it, many many people have fallen into that the apostle paul will talk about that a little bit later on i can't remember it was demas i think he's a demas right because he loved the things of this world he's no longer with us it drew him away and he was part of paul's tribe they were traveling from place to place, preaching about Jesus, sharing the gospel. And then all of a sudden, because he loved the things of this world, things just separated. We're talking about money. We're talking about God as the priority of all things. And so everything is surrendered under God. Again, we also, when we talk about money, it's before we kind of go on to the next, uh, the G as it were, we have to understand money is not the problem. Money is immaterial. Money is inanimate. Money is paper and cheap metal. Too often we get that, that quote of, misquote of Scripture, right? Money is the root of all evil. It's not money is the root of all evil. It's the, the love of money. It's the lusting after money produces all kinds of evil, right? So we've got to make sure we're quoting it right. It's not the money. Money means nothing. Money really has no value. Even when we think of the the money, the finances of the world, for any particular country, their money is only worth as much as the gold they have in the bank or the products that they produce. Otherwise, it's just paper. Have you ever seen some of those those little bills from some foreign countries and it's like five million on it? You're like, what? That must be worth a lot. No, it's about five cents Canadian. Because it's just simply, there's no goods to back up their their, their economic system of things. But we have to realize money is not the problem. It's the pursuit. It's putting our love of it and the things that it provides over and above our love for God. Money will not master anyone. The pursuit of money will master most. Will master most. It's our love and our devotion that's going to tear us apart to who it is that we're going to serve. And so this is all part of this this framework when we talk about stewardship of finances. Um, the second G that we're going to talk about we're going to go through these ones rather quickly Uh, once we get that framework of God the next one is when we talk about finances we have to produce we have to have a mindset within us of gratitude of gratitude because again we should be thankful right I love that this morning right we're talking about this idea of thankfulness we should just be thankful for whatever we have just to be thankful for it to be thankful in all things, Paul would say. How do we be thankful? How do we have hearts of gratitude, even when we're in the bottom of the financial barrel some days? How do we have that, that, that hankering, right? Well, it's simply to say what doesn't matter because it's all about God. I know it's an easy answer. I know it's easy to say. But really, God is the one who provides for it, provides for us. We have to have lives of gratitude. We need to be thankful for the things that we do have instead of always looking at the things we don't have. And this will lead to this idea of contentment. The Apostle Paul says, I've learned to be content, whether I've got a lot or whether I've got a little. 
confession right here, right now, I am not always a content person. When it comes to finances, this is my kryptonite. I, I remember s- sitting up here when I candidated here at Mac. I said, I mean, I struggle like any other guy. Pornography is not my problem. Lust isn't my problem. I can go through all these different things. Money, for some odd reason, is, is my kryptonite. That's my weakness. That's the thing I always have to, to struggle. I always have to keep ahead of. Because I get in this, this malcontent state of things. And often because I'm not always thankful for what I do have. And that's where we have to grow. We have to grow in that contentment. Because a contentment is a great thing. Oftentimes we get into what I call the, the Nebuchadnezzar syndrome. I don't remember the story from Daniel chapter 4. King Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. He had everything. One of the largest empires really known ever. And the story is told in Daniel chapter 4. He's walking one day on the top of his palace. He's looking out over all the incredible empire he has, all the riches that he has. And he simply just says, look at all that I have accomplished. And right away God says, it's going to stop right here. For this period of time, you're going to go out. Your hair is going to grow long. You're going to get fingernails like talons. And you're going to live amongst the beasts in the field. And it is. His sanity is stripped from him for a season. Why? Because he didn't have any gratefulness. He had no thankfulness. He had no gratitude in his life whatsoever. It was all about him. Look what I have done. And God taught him a lesson, which is amazing because we get this incredible pagan, uh, pagan king who God humbles. He wasn't a follower of God in any stretch of the imagination. But a little bit later on in Daniel chapter 4, he humbles himself before the God of heaven. Because it's this, this life of gratitude that he was trying to teach him. Are we thankful for simply the simple things that we have? The think, simple things that, that, that are provided for us. And again, we cannot settle simply for uh, the idea of being thankful when we've got a lot in the bank. We've got to be thankful when we've got nothing in the bank. I don't know about you, but that's usually the default for me is the little bit in the bank. And I got to learn to be content. I got to learn to say, you know what? I, I got to trust God that this is going to happen, that this is going to get paid for. And I know, don't talk to my wife because she's always the one who brings me down from my, my financial anxieties. Don't worry, God's going to provide. It's going to work out in the end. Man, I hate that statement. But it's true. It's true. We have to learn to have lives of gratitude no matter where we're at. Don't fall into those traps of saying, well, I'm done for. This is it. This is the end. Gratitude is a huge component in our financial stewardship. What it means to look at our finances. Not sort of as the half empty, but the half full. Next is, is generosity. And this is just going to come from this idea of gratitude. If I'm thankful for what I have, I'm going to be able to share it with others. I love to give things away. I love being generous. Too bad I don't always have a lot to give away. But what do I have to give away? Right? We don't have a whole lot of finances, but you know what? I probably shouldn't admit this. Guys, I've taken up baking. Yeah? Oh, so some of you guys. Yay, wow, I wasn't expecting that. Okay. I've started baking. We got nothing. I got flour and sugar. And so I've been making like banana loaves and cookies. I'm taking them up to my neighbors, right? Right? I'm just like, hey, just building relationships with my neighbors. I got nothing. It's not like I can take them out to the movies or supper or anything. I bake them cookies. We're we're neighbors? Okay. (laughs) But we ought to have lives of, of generosity because we're so thankful for what we have. And again, this will go back to contentment. But I read an amazing book on, on contentment, and, and the, the, the guy was hardcore. And he simply says, you know what, we don't deserve anything. We don't deserve nothing, right? Our lives are a gift from God. But he said, even more so, if we simply just have salvation, that is something that we would never be able to pay back, and we should just be ha- thankful to be saved. And from that, right, that generosity flows out of it. I've got a precious gift of salvation that I can give away. I mean, at least in the words, I don't give salvation to people. Don't beat me up in the parking lot. But I have something amazing to give to people. 
right? I may not have, what, what, is, what does Peter say, right, to the, the beggar outside the temple? Silver or gold, I got none. <laughs> but what I do give to you, I give you to you in the name of Christ, right? Get up and walk. Maybe that's why we don't exercise spiritual gifts enough. We're so ready writing checks. Maybe that's why we don't have the miracles and the healings like we should. We're so ready to say, well, can I, you know, pay for your taxi to the hospital or something like that? I don't know. That, that was just a freebie. That wasn't even in my notes, people. That's, but, but it's amazing, right? This generosity. Jesus, he was the greatest model of generosity, right? Only he is God who became flesh, who left his throne, who left everything to come and dwell amongst us who didn't even have a place to lay his head, the scripture says, right? He was generous with his life. He gave his very life to us. This is this model of generosity. I thought of the stories of the the thousands that he fed, right? They came to hear Jesus teach and preach, and they they were hungry for what Jesus had to say. And then all of a sudden the disciple says, you know, well, it's almost noon. You should send them away to grab a bite. And what does Jesus say? You feed them. What? And it's interesting because they go and they bring up a little bit of, you know, bread and fish. And, and he's like, yeah, that'll do. Right? But it's this generosity. It's this generosity that, that Jesus came, right, to give his very life. He didn't make us all rich. Right? He didn't make the disciples all rich. In fact, he says, you know what, you're going to leave all this stuff. This is the question that they have later on, right? Peter says, Pfft. We've left everything, verse 28. We've left everything to follow you. And Jesus says, you know what? It's going to be paid back to you. Does this mean money? No. It's relationships, isn't it? Mothers and brothers and fathers and sisters and all these things. I've got more brothers and mothers and fathers and sisters than I've ever had. Yeah, amen. So there's this idea of generosity. We've got an incredible gift here within a church that we need to be bringing people in. People are lonely out there. They don't feel that they got anybody. And you're like, come on in. Let me introduce you to my 30 mother, brothers, and sisters, and 50 of these. And we got generosity here, people. It doesn't have to be money, right? But obviously that will come from it if you've got it. If you've got it, give it. I thought, isn't it interesting that in the early church, two of the main struggles that pop up were about finances? Remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira? Right? They, had some, they had some land, they were going to sell it, and then they decided, well, let's hold a little bit back. But they decided to lie to Peter about this was the money that they got. Oh, yeah, this is all that we got. Remember the story, what happened? They died. They dropped dead. It was about money, it was about finance. It was about a lack of generosity, wasn't it? Peter says, this was yours to do with as you wish. It wasn't a command. But you held back. Why? You lied. This generosity side of things. Generosity is always synonymous with sacrifice within Scripture, right? We have the widow at the temple who gave her very last, and Jesus points her out. There's this, this generosity that she had. She figured, well, the temple must need it more than I do. There's this idea of generosity. Paul talks about this generosity to the Macedonian church in uh, 2 Corinthians. He says, they gave out of their po- poverty. They were so excited to give because they had salvation. It was this generosity this, this giving nature that was starting to, to be created within that early church. Now, often when we talk about generosity and, 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 and giving, I know we're kind of running out of time here. I'm just almost done, okay? Just bear with me, please. We talk about giving. We talk about, obviously, offerings, don't we? This is another bane of many people's existence, this idea of offerings, right? This is always that. All the other always got that, that the plate that's going around. Always got the little baggie that's happening, right? This, this idea Particularly when we talk about tithes, okay? Tithes. Tithes simply means like a tenth, a ten percent. This goes back to Mosaic Law. This even goes back to before the Mosaic Law. This goes back to Abraham and Melchizedek, okay? You can check that back out in Genesis. But this idea of tithes, is tithes a requirement today? No. It's not a requirement today. I could make an argument for it, but I don't see enough evidence for it. Why do we do tithes? Tithes is a benchmark. It's a suggestion, right? It sounds good, <laughs> okay? But we're not under law anymore. We're under grace. 
We're not under the law of 10%. We are under the law of generosity. That's going to make you guys squirm. Because it's not just about 10% anymore. If 10% for you is easy, give 20%. I don't care. 20% is easy, give 50%. We're not under law, we're under generosity because we have a love from the Father that helps us to be generous. If it's 2% for you, that's all that you can manage, great, work to 5%. Because we're working towards generosity. Not a level, not a benchmark, not a legalistic thinking. We're not like the rich young ruler says, what must I do? I have to give 10%. No. Generous. Give as much as you possibly can. That's what God requires of us, is generosity. We just use tithes as a benchmark, okay? Throw it out there. That's all there is to it. But we have to think of our finances in a generous sort of way. Use our, uh, excuse me, use our finances to be generous, to bring God glory, to bless people, to show them the goodness of God. Finally, quickly, last is growth. We don't often think about financial growth when we come to Christians. Why is that? Why do we always want to put money into the mattress, as it were? Right? God has given us resources. He's given us money. He's given us money to grow and to produce wealth. The problem is, is that sometimes we, we often think that that's bad to be rich. It's not bad to be rich. It's bad to want to be rich. It's bad to have that pursuit and that love of that. But it's not bad to be rich. Because again, Jesus is always pointing everything to our relationship with God. Do we love God or do we love money? That is always that ultimate question of where we pull back the stewardship of finances and wealth and all that sort of thing. Okay? So growing money is not a bad thing. In fact, we would probably be, uh, I don't know, irresponsible, I guess maybe would be a word, if God has blessed you with money and you're hiding it within a mattress right now. Give it away. There you go. Yes, I'll give you my account number after the service. Uh, No. Give it away or produce more wealth. I had a very interesting conversation with a young man a number of years ago, uh, and it's quite funny because he, he, he says, oh, yes, I, you know, I give to the church. And he said, uh, um, he says, but I don't let my left hand know what my right hand is doing. And he says, I don't, I, don't want, I don't want a tax receipt. It's quite interesting. He told me how much he gave, and he was quite promotional about it. Uh, but he says, I don't want a tax receipt at the end of the year. And I said, brother, I said, that's kind of stupid. I said, the government is giving you a freebie. So you can claim this on your income tax. And that's not going to last forever, folks. There's going to be a day where we're gonna, that's going to be taken away. But I said, you give your money, you get your tax receipt, then you give that tax receipt money back. Like, produce the wealth, people. We could keep going here a little bit more and more. And it was just this mind-blowing for him. It was crazy. Jesus says in Luke chapter 16, he says, use the unrighteous wealth for eternal purposes. Grow it. Use these means. He's given us abilities. He makes accountants. He makes financial advisors. There's Christian people out there all galore about money. What are we using the money for? We've always got to pull those reins back a little bit. Again, if we're just simply trying to invest the things that God has given us just to build bigger barns and storehouses and sit back and enjoy it for the rest of our lives, that is wrong. That is absolutely wrong. But if we've got the mindset that I can make more wealth, produce more wealth, so I can send more people overseas to preach the gospel, or I can support more, you know, missions activities, or justice and compassion, if I can do more things within that local church, or through the local church, amen, go nuts. Don't quote that. Amen, go nuts. But, you know, this t-shirt. Amen, go nuts. Grow the wealth. Okay? So this summary, very quickly. We overcome the strongholds of wealth. Okay? It's not bad. Wealth, money, not a bad thing. Love, pursuit of it, bad thing. Greed for it, bad thing. Because we put gold over God. We cannot. God has to be first. He has to be the priority. He has to be the priority. We have to have lives of of gratitude, thankfulness. When we've got a lot, when we've got a little, be thankful for it. I grew up in in a poor home, and maybe that's why I've got money issues today. We grew fairly poor. Right? We were on welfare most of the time. We didn't have a whole lot of things. But I didn't lack anything. I had clothes on my back. They were hand-me-downs from my two older brothers, of course. Uh, I had food in my belly. Right? I had a roof over my head. And truly, I didn't lack anything. Okay? I didn't lack anything. 
and it has, I should have a greater heart of gratitude, and I'm learning. I'm learning to do that, to be content, just be thankful. I've got this. And that should lead us into, into uh, generosity, giving stuff away, giving stuff away. You can't take it with you. Somebody's going to get all your stuff when you're dead. That's a little blunt, okay? It's a little bit blunt, but someday we are all going to die and somebody's going to get our stuff. So what are we going to do? How are we using that stuff? Again, wealth is more than just money in the bank. Some of us, if we look at our financial sort of portfolio, we've got a lot more money than we think we do. How are we having lives of generosity? How are we using that generosity to, to bring glory to God, to bring people to the kingdom? Okay? Again, Paul never says to go broke with this giving, this generosity. Right? He says don't give more so that you're poor. But he says so that we can be fair, so that we can be supporting one another, particularly within the church. And then we can reach together beyond these walls. Gratitude, generosity, and then finally growth. Don't be afraid of growth. But be wise. Use that unrighteous wealth for God's glory, for building his kingdom. I thought it was quite interesting. I'm going to close with this. The end of uh, chapter 10. Remember, it started off with divorce, things that separate, things that divide. And then it ends up with the story of blind Bartimaeus. All right, this guy just sitting on the, end of the, uh, on the side of the road. He says, a blind beggar. He had nothing. He had squat. What a contrast to the rich young ruler, right? This blind Bartimaeus was blind. He couldn't see anything. He was just a beggar. He had no means really of support other than the kindness of, of other people. And basically he began to cry out and shout out to Jesus, give me my sight. I want to see. And at the end of it all, Jesus heals him, gives him his sight. He says, go your way, your, go your way, your faith has made you well. Verse 52, and it says, immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. This rich young ruler thought he had sight. I've been doing all these things since I was a boy. He thought he had all the sight. He thought he had all the cards. But what happened when he was challenged with that weakness of his? He was disheartened and he walked away. All this guy, Bartimaeus, had nothing. All he wanted was his sight. Most of us have our sight here, maybe diminishing and failing in certain ways, at least physical sight, but more importantly, we've got spiritual sight. We begin to see what God is doing in and around us, calling us to build his kingdom, to build up his church. Are we walking away from Jesus because our allegiance between gold and God is divided? Or are we like Bartimaeus who's just so happy to have sight, spiritual, physical sight, that we're just going to follow him no matter what and be thankful for it? We have a decision. We're going to play the last song. I'll get the worship team to come on up. Um, during the last song or after the last song, if you would, take some time. I'm going to stay up at the front if anybody wants to. Uh, discuss or some prayer or something like that. This is a stronghold. I know it's a stronghold for many of us, right? Uh, whether it's just a contentment, whether it's just a pull, or maybe it's just a grind, whatever it might be. I'm just going to stay up at the front. I'd love to talk with you or to, uh, to pray with you. Um, if not today or not this morning, do it today. Really check yourselves over. Are you following God or are you following gold? Do you have a life of contentment? of gratitude, thankful for anything and everything that God gives us. How about generosity? How about using that wealth for God's kingdom? Check those things. Ask the questions. Let the Spirit give you the answers. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you, Lord, for uh, just, again, another day of your grace and your wisdom. We thank you, Lord, for your word. You have not left us as orphans. Lord God, your spirit resides in us as believers. Your spirit is drawing and calling others into your kingdom. And your word is here for us. So Lord God, I thank you for, um, for the teaching that you have presented uh, through the story of the rich young ruler. I pray, God, that you would challenge us. For those that, that this is that stronghold for us. As Lord God, as you have been merciful in, in my own life. You've been gracious to me, Lord God. Too many times I've asked for repentance and by your grace, I learn a little more. 
And so, Lord God, I pray for my brothers and sisters here that, that if this is a stronghold for them, that you would help them to, to learn a little more here this morning. And that together, Lord God, that we would just surrender to you. Again, make you the Lord of our lives, the one who provides for us, the one who sustains us. So, Lord God, we just, again, want to surrender to you. We give you everything. Lord God, use it for your glory. Work in us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.